How's my hair? Is my hair okay? <laughs> How's it going, guys? What's happening? What's up, YouTube? Looks like we got one person here so far. Just going to hang out because this is kind of becoming a Monday thing, right? Now, we did it at noon last time, so I didn't catch all the people because it was a little too early. Um, but hopefully, we'll catch some different people because now we're about four and a half hours later than we did last Monday. So hope you guys are doing well. Uh, I've got the comment section up, so feel free if you have any questions, anything you want to know. I may not catch them all. Uh, oh, thank you, Joshua. I, <laughs> You rock too. You guys all rock. Um, so I may not catch everything because last time I was on here, the comment section went way too fast for me to keep up. So if there's anything you ask that I don't address, feel free to message me afterward. You can get a hold of me hold me on social media. Hey, Robin. Oh, Geeks Who Eat. What's up? Uh, so if I don't get to your question and you put it in the comment section, feel free. You can send me an email. I'm food at JoniSimon.com. So however you want to get a hold of me, whatever questions I don't get to in this, um, but I will try to answer as many as humanly possible. <laughs> I love it. I'm Mrs. Bite Shot. <laughs> Does that make Mr. Ryan Mr. Bite Shot? I'm going to tell him that. He's going to love that. So we've got people coming in if you want to, just because it's always fun to know. Uh, let me know. Hey, <laughs> Victoria, uh, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and just let me know where you're coming in from. Oh, Jared's coming in from Sonoma County. Very nice little California up in there. I believe it's 3.30 in California, if I'm not mistaken. But I'm going to go ahead and jump in because, uh, oh my goodness, <laughs> if it is 1.30 in the morning in Egypt, you need to go to bed. <laughs> Although, I'm, who am I to talk? I'm up all hours of the night. That's how I have a YouTube channel. I feel like you kind of have to be a late night owl to have a YouTube channel. Um, Massachusetts, Atlanta, Portugal. Very, very good. Illinois. There's a lot of Canadians. There's always a lot of Canadians. And there's a lot of Canadian YouTube creators. Is that? Am I correct in assuming that? I feel like some of my favorites are all Canadians, the domestic geek who a lot of people all say is my, do I'm her doppelganger. She's my doppelganger. Um, she's Canadian. And uh, How to Cake It, Yolanda Gamp, she's Canadian, Peter Ginnon, some of our favorites, all, all Canadian. Um, all right, well, let's jump on in. So I had an appointment this afternoon out in uh, Chandler, Arizona with a restaurant that I'm going to be doing a shoot at mm, end of next week. And I wanted to kind of get the lay of the land, get a sense of the space and just talk through details with uh, the folks over there. So it was about a 35 minutes drive, which is a little further than I typically go, but well worth it. Um, Houston, Texas is still waiting on the workshop. Yeah, don't worry. We're going to have the first workshop here in Phoenix. And if all goes well with that, we'll bring them all over the place. So just stay tuned. Um, what is shaking bacon? Should I make some West Shaken Bacon t-shirts? <laughs> Ryan's like, I'll totally design it. He got really excited about that. He likes doing design work. But okay, so I was in Chandler, Arizona, which is where we have our Ikea store. So I don't usually go to Ikea because it's not super nearby me, but it was close to the restaurant that I was uh, doing the little pre-shoot consultation with. So I wanted to show you guys what I got because, you know, I got some fun things, if that sounds good to you guys. <laughs> and again, if you have any questions, feel free to shout them out um, or any rec requests for videos. Um, I would love that as well. Okay, so jumping on in. First things first, I got these table runners. How much now? Okay. <laughs> Maybe you guys can help me with the pronunciation on these. This is always the comedy show, right? When <laughs> Americans try to pronounce the Swedish names of these things. But I love these table runners. And I actually have these table runners. I use them a lot for TV food styling. Um, I've got them in blue and green and red and all sorts of colors. But I went ahead and got the tan. And I also got the gray because I thought those would look really pretty cool for some photography shots. And uh, yeah, so I picked, picked these up. Dublin, Ireland. Very good. Very good. Got people. This is the best part about YouTube. We got people from all over the world. And thank you guys so much for subscribing to my channel. Because seriously, when I hit 10,000, I'm not going to I'm not going to open this because it's going to be a disaster. Um, I like literally tears. So thank you. Thank you so much for subscribing to my channel. It means a lot. It means that this is helpful. So that is awesome. And I love to be helpful. So OK, now this is a very fun thing. Check it out. Check out this bowl. And why I have not had a wooden bowl so far, like I, cause I was doing a shoot this morning. If you watch me on Instagram stories, you'll see what I was up to. And I was doing a Caesar salad and Caesar salad to me is always done 
in a bowl like this, but for some reason, I didn't have a wooden bowl. So of course I'm at Ikea. I'm like, I, I have to get this. Now, clearly I've already done the shoot this morning and it's not in a wooden bowl, but next time I do a Caesar salad, I'll have this. Uh, what is a good photo setup for barbecue? Ray Max Kitchen and Grill wants to know. Well, for good barbecue, I mean, some great barbecue shots are really fun, like literally just open up the hatch on that smoker and get some of those shots kind of like with the angle of the light coming in this way, you're shooting it this way and you can get those really great glistening looks on, you know, like the ribs, the wreck ribs looks really good. Um, barbecue can be hard because it is a lot of brown food. So it's all about, you know, making sure you got like a really nice sloppy sauce on there. There's some really great inspiration pictures that I go to whenever I'm doing barbecue. Um, Peden and Monk, if you guys have ever heard of them, I'll leave that name down here. You can probably find them on Instagram. I just Google them. Peden, Peden and Monk. They do beautiful work and I love how they do grilled meats because um, again, grilled meats, a lot of brown, so it can be sort of challenging, but they do a really great job of making it all about the texture and getting some really nice tight shots. They do a lot of flat lays. So um, barbecue can look great. Like if you do a rack of ribs and you slice them up and you turn them out, you know, so they're all a little different. That's a fun way to do it. But I would say when it's barbecue, when it comes to styling it, feel free to get sloppy. Like barbecue is a sloppy, messy business eating with your hands, making a mess. So feel free to communicate that in the images, you know, to have really buttoned down barbecue pics. It's like, no, we want to get in there and tear up that barbecue sandwich. So hopefully, hopefully that helps you out. Um, all right. I know Joshua, I hit 10 K last week or on Saturday and it, it literally, it blew my mind. I was in tears. It's only been six months. I mean, you guys know the story, right? I, I've got another YouTube channel that I've put 200 videos into cooking videos over the last two and a half years. And it's still, it's probably, I think it's probably, I haven't checked on it in a while, like 8,500 8, subscribers. So to have this one just take off so quickly and, um, for you guys to be so enthusiastic about it just means the world to me. It means, okay, this YouTube thing works. I just wasn't doing the right thing before. So it's okay. That's, that's the creative process, right? You got to throw a lot of spaghetti on the wall. You try to see what sticks. And then all of a sudden you might have a moment of inspiration and start a YouTube channel that actually works. So, um, all right. Wishing Melon says you love wood. So tropical you live in. Oh, okay. Ch -ch 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 -ch. Um, so your goal is food photography and styling in Cancun. Oh, so you're looking for some tutorials on working with wood? Uh, definitely, I use a lot of wood in my backdrop. So if that's something you're looking for, just check my Instagram. You'll, you'll see plenty there for sure. Um, oh, <laughs> Rob George is very specific, 10,647 as of the time of this video. I know, it's mind blowing, right? All right, other things that I got, okay. These were the best. I was so excited about this. So you know at Ikea, they have this section in the back where it's the stuff that's all marked down because it's broken or returned or whatever. I've been on the hunt for some really cool napkins that are patterned but can't be too loud of a pattern, right? Because napkins are like a whole situation. And you want napkins that have enough color, enough personality that they add to the image, but that they're not distracting. Because napkins, if you look at a lot of images, napkins can just be distracting, that they're pulling the focus from the food, whether that's the color or the pattern. So these ones, oh my gosh, I was so excited. And they were on sale for $1.50 a piece. Now check out this pattern. This is going to be killer. It's this great little green. I don't know if that greed is reading uh, for you. What is the name of my cooking channel? Dana, Donna wants to know. Well, it's really embarrassing. So if you go over there and watch any of those videos, just be prepared. That's where I learned how to talk on camera. So they're a little cringeworthy, but it's just Joni Ray Simon, which is me. So backslash, yeah, youtube.com backslash Joni Ray Simon. And as y'all run over there and go watch my super cringy videos, I apologize. All right, but here is uh, this napkin and I'm super excited about it. I love this stripe going down it and it's got just a really great texture. It's muted, so it won't disrupt the food. You can tie it around the handle of a skillet. That'll look really nice or you can just kind of throw it underneath the food. You can do all sorts of stuff, but I just, I think this pattern is really killer. And then I got another one similar to it, but in blue. 
And again, this, this just makes me so happy. A dollar fifty. Thank you, IKEA, for having wonderful things in your knockoff uh, throwaway section. So uh, this one again, and really great napkin. So for those of you who struggle with napkins, just really when you're selecting them, don't select the ones that you like because you want to put them in your kitchen. You got to select them for photos. They've got to be not too loud, but enough texture and interest to elevate the image, right? Right? All right. Uh, greetings from Panama. Nice to meet you. You have that one too. You have that same napkin, Jessica? <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> um, all right. Um, now, Rob, yes, I know my husband is skinny and I feed him a lot, but you should have seen him when I met him. We met 16 years ago and I tell you, he was, he was a toothpick then. So if you can believe it, he's put on weight since we've met. <laughs> All right, so I already showed you the bowl. Let me see what else I got in here. Okay, I've got this, which I need to unwrap. It's another bowl, another wooden bowl, because, you know, I need it. But this one is really fun because it's lightweight. Um, this is some faux wood situation. I thought it would look cool if you had something in here, like a salad shot overhead. But then it also has the white on the exterior. And I just, I don't have a light colored bowl of this size. I mean, these are first world problems, food stylist problems. <laughs> uh, but it's just, it's so nice to have a variety of bowls, which brings me to my next item. Uh, let's see. Oh, don't, don't subscribe Remix by Jorge. <laughs> I'm not putting any new content up there. I mean, unless I, sh well, no, I'm going to focus on the bite shot because that's, that's what's working. So, um, all right. There's no Ikea near you. Um, Stephanie, hmm, if there's no Ikea near you. I mean, I do really great uh, work. I don't know if there's a Target near you. Target has fantastic stuff, especially the new line that's been put out by um, what Chip and Joe from what's that show they do? You guys know the show on TLC, right? It's the the house the house show. So they have their own section now at Target, which is fantastic because it's got a bunch of matte plates. I love matte plates because they don't have shine on them, right? So that it's like home and hearth. I've got a couple of the candles. I've bought a couple things from there. Got some really great salad tongs and just good quality colors. So Target's a great great place as well, as well as the thrift shops, right? We love we love thrift shops. I'm actually doing a video. Uh, I've been talking with good. Goodwill, which is a thrift shop chain here in Arizona, I think in multiple places in the U.S. Um, and they want to have me in and they're going to let me do a go berserk in their Goodwill. So we're going to we're going to have a party and we're going to do the video in the Goodwill store showing you kind of how I select items, that kind of thing. So it should be should be a hoot. <laughs> um, yes. Wishing Melon. I go to the thrift store all the time. Not all the time, but definitely when I need things. Um, the thrift store is the way to go. And that's where I'll usually check first because the prices are just the absolute best. Um, oh, Stephanie, good. A discount at Target. Uh, I should not have a discount at Target because my money would go all to Target. Okay, so back to bowls. I bought this bowl. Now, I love this bowl because it's kind of a plate. It's kind of a bowl, right? It's not very deep. But this will be fantastic for photographing because it's not super deep. You know, sometimes you want sort of that straight on angle or like slightly elevated angle. Uh, but if you've got a really deep bowl, you can't see the food. So having a more shallow bowl is really, really helpful. And again, surprising. I didn't have I didn't have a white basic bowl of this size. Now I have <laughs> plenty of other white bowls right over there. More than I should have, but that's okay. Um, that's my job. Okay, so what else did I get? I don't even remember getting this. Oh, no, I did remember. <laughs> what is this? It's a fry pan for five bucks. I was like, yes, I need a fry pan for five bucks. I mean, I have plenty of cookware, but it is a nice thing, especially when you're doing videos. I sometimes do videos for clients or I will cook the prep process. It is important to have clean looking cookie sheets or cookware because uh, if you're using your old busted stuff, it just, it doesn't look as great unless that is the vibe that the video is going for. The photos are going for a busted look then most certainly rock that out. But a lot of the clients that I work with, at least, and this is maybe just particular to the ones that I work with, they want it to look clean. They want it to look, you know, updated and modern and not janky. So this is brand new, $5. I mean, please give me a break. And you can, you know, use it for self-defense. <laughs> All right. What else have I got? Cool. Okay. This one was like out of left field. And when you see me post pictures of this on Instagram at some point, you go, oh, because she went for it. I got 
pink plates. <laughs> I don't own any pink plates. As much as I love pink, I don't own any of these because it is not a typical color that any client would ever request. Um, but I love these because they're matte. I mean, they've got a little bit of sheen you can see there, uh, but for the most part, it's a matte finish, which is just great compared to a glossy um, because it's, you don't have to deal with the glare quite so much when you're photographing it. You know, you guys ever get in that situation, you're photographing the food and the glare on the plate is just super distracting. This helps eliminate that. And I also, um, it seems to be a lot of folks that I work with and a lot of the images that I get requested to shoot don't want a ton of embellishment on the plate. Um, and then also don't want any extra rim to it. So it's kind of, you know, I'd see it just kind of bows up a little bit, but more or less, less a very flat plate. There's not a lot of embellishment again, so we can really focus on the food. So pink plates. I mean, how cute would like a fried egg look on this? I might need to do a fried egg tomorrow. We're gonna, we'll see. We'll see if I have time. We'll see how filming goes tomorrow. All right, and then very last but not least, I got some flowers. And this is where you gotta be careful. Let's see. Oh, Fixer Upper. That's the name of the show. <laughs> oh, Veggie Lexi, you just shot a smoothie bowl in a pink bowl. Nice. I love it. So I yeah, I gotta think the pink can set things off for sure. Um <laughs> when will I learn? Your girlfriend made you buy his pink plates. Hey, you guys, by the way, when will you learn? If you like my channel, you're going to like his channel. So definitely go follow him, okay? If you guys are not already, when will you learn? Feel free to throw your link to your um, YouTube channel in here. He's got a great like DIY backdrops. He's got great photography tutorials. So go check him out. But meanwhile, I got some flowers, some fake flowers. Okay, I got to be careful with fake flowers. <laughs> if they are in focus, and in any way, even if they're good fake flowers, like these are relatively decent peonies. Um, but if they, if they at all, if there's evidence that they're fake, it's going to read in the picture because everything, you know, see everything in the picture, right? So fake flowers I use, but I'll put them in the back when I'm doing a narrow depth of field. And this is just in soft focus and it's nobody's going to know, right? Because there's no detail. So we're not going to see that these are totally fake plastic leaves, right? <laughs> so, um, but I thought these were good, especially as I'm going to be photographing a lot of spring stuff here pretty soon and just having some nice little pops of color and green and pink in the back, um, I think would be, would be quite nice. Um, will I post the names of the plates? Sure. Let's see. What set is this? Um, oh, <laughs> um, I will be happy to figure that out. And oh, the Dinera, D-I-N-E-R-A. I don't know. I don't know how do you pronounce that in Swedish. Um, but I'll definitely link everything that I've talked about here afterward if I can find it. I may not be able to find a link to the napkins because, again, they were on closeout. Um, and then I bought one more thing. One more thing. It's also from the fake foliage department is some, I think these are supposed to be eucalyptus. The smike, smica, smica, smica. Um, some fake flowers. Um, so, oh, Noom M wants to know, when did your love for the camera happen? So when did I fall in love with the camera? Um, I bought, well, I've always had fun with, I, well, I have a degree in art from my undergrad degree is in art. And so I had a good number of, Art, studio art classes. And so I think that really helped train my eye. But um, I've had point and shoots ever since I was a kid. I always loved photographing things, uh, but didn't really start to take it seriously until I started blogging. And, you know, if any of you have followed the food blog world, you know that people have definitely upped the ante in terms of the quality of the images. And so that part of food blogging really spoke to me. Uh, and I got my first DSLR camera in 2008. 2009. I'll have to double check the date. Um, but I just started you know, sharing pictures and if, and that food blog still exists. And I will tell you those pictures, I shared some in the Facebook group recently. They are rough. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know what white balance was. Everything was shooting auto, all completely underexposed. But if you look at it, you go, okay, no, I know what she was going for. You know, you've got like that little thing, that little bit of taste that gets you into the game. Um, and you then at that point, I continued to just pursue photography. And then it was about three years ago uh, when some major life stuff happened. And I decided uh, I really wanted to dig in further to photography, uh, really got 
really well acquainted with it. And then lo and behold, ended up with my first client kind of on accident. Just, I shot some stuff for free for them. Uh, and they came back and said, Hey, you know, I shot some stuff for my food blog for them. And they came back and said, can you shoot our whole menu? And it, it kind of, the story tells itself from there, but, um, you know, it, I love photography. I love food. And this is, you know, I do some people photography, but I don't, I don't love it. It kind of drives me nuts. So my mad props to anybody who does portrait photography, I will, I have always said, now, never say never, but I will never shoot a wedding. I mean, no, no. <laughs> I just, that is too much pressure. You cannot uh, recreate a wedding. I can recreate, I mean, I don't want to recreate the 10 layer cake I just made last week, but you know, there, you can always recreate the food, but whew, a wedding, that sounds like the most stressful thing to photograph. And I don't know, I just, food, food speaks to me. Um, Let's see, suggestions on where to take some backgrounds, I, everything to put under the preparations to vary with different dishes and recipes. Okay, good. So that's a good request on how to decide on what to use for a background or a surface. We went through last week's video, if you guys missed it, um, is all about how to make your own surfaces and backdrops. So you can definitely check that video. Um, but uh, how far away do you put the softbox lights from and do you put the light overhead? So, okay, is this, let's see. So in terms of the distance, Cooking with a Little Spice wants to know uh, as far as using a softbox. Now, I don't use softboxes. What I use, I just got some speed lights because I was like, okay, I need to get into this off-camera flash business. Um, but I still just use my diffuser. I always have the diffuser super close to the table so that I have softer, more minimal shadows. Um, that's my style. If you want longer shadows, put the light further away, right? Light further away, longer shadows, light closer to smaller shadows. And I keep waving these around. Anyway, there's my eucalyptus. Um, but uh, but then as far as the distance of, typically I'm shooting with LED lights. That's like 99.9% .9 of everything you see that I post on Instagram or anywhere is shot with LED lights. And so that varies depending on the mood that I'm going in, depending on the atmosphere of the space and the light and everything like that. Um, but I would say generally like two feet, three feet, sometimes four feet, just depending. Again, I kind of feel it out depending on what I'm looking for. And the same with the speed lights, you know, um, that also now the speed lights, you can vary the intensity and all that stuff. So more to come on the speed lights as I get more familiar with them, because there were so many of you who, uh, watched the video that I did on the cheap artificial lights. And I use the low ego lights. Uh, those are great, but apparently really hard to come by anymore. I bought mine. I bought probably like, I've got about four of them uh, that I bought yeah, probably about three years ago weren't weren't hard to get a hold of, but apparently they're hard to get a hold of today. So I thought, well, okay, another you know within a hundred to two hundred dollar solution for artificial light because there's a lot of folks who are photographing late at night and need something um, that that's going to solve that problem. So that's why I went and I got myself some speed lights. I'm working on them as soon as I feel solid on those. I'll definitely do some videos on it. But um, yeah, yeah. Let's see. All right. Sounds like you're answering each other's questions. This is really, really good. Um, what factors go into, Jarrett wants to know, what factors go into how you decide on the color palette for the shots around colors of plates, complementing props and such? That is a great question. And definitely, Jarrett, that is a video that is in the works. Um, color is so important to your images, you know, that you um, are using complementary colors or just depending on the mood that you're going for, the colors can make or break an image. They can, you know, cause a distraction or they can cause harmony. So that is a great question. And definitely there are some helpful rules to follow. But you guys know, you know the thing about rules, right? It's good to know the rules. So then you can break the rules, <laughs> right? That's what they're there for. They're made to be broken. Um, do, do, do. Yep, Rob, definitely. Um, another website, Ad I'm trying to remember, Adobe has a color palette, uh, like a color wheel and even a color palette builder. I think it's, let me Google it real quick. Uh, Adobe color, I'm trying to remember. Palette. Here we go. Do, do, do. Here we go. Color.adobe.com. This is super helpful, guys. Here we go. I'm going to drop it in 
right here. Oh, Robin's all over it. <laughs> so if you go there, what you can do is definitely pick up some colors and then it's going to show you what's complementary to that, what's analogous to that and really help you kind of make some decisions, right? Like if you're really wanting to, you know, communicate this color of teal, well, here's going to be the great complementary color of orange that goes with it. Um, do, do, do. All right. I think we're doing good. Uh, Oh, F, F.0. So glad you got your you got your first paid shoot for a restaurant. That is awesome. <laughs> and the shoot went well. D tell me that the shoot went well. I hope it went well. <laughs> I'm excited for you. That is great, great news. All right. So I think I think we're doing good. I'm just going back through all the comments, see if I missed anything. Do, 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 do. All right. Oh, cooking with a little spice wants to know if the food you're filming is dark, would you say to use bright accessories like napkins in the picture? It totally depends. I mean, like the dark food photography tutorial that I did, that was dark chocolate and um, on dark plates with dark, it was dark, 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 right? But placing the light very specifically on the food so that the light was telling the story and telling our eyeballs where to focus. So um, definitely, you know, having a contrast is a helpful thing, but I would say the more important key to drive an image is the light. And then the color is sort of this secondary, um, you know, whether you've got bright props or dark props, that's sort of a secondary driver to it in my humble opinion. <laughs> um, so yeah. So I would say the light is first and most important, uh, but definitely that is a tool using different colors to if you've got, you know, dark food and you use light things, then certainly that's going to um, that's going to work. I remember a shoot I did early on for somebody and it was uh, orange colored food and I had picked orange colored napkins and I got some very specific feedback from the client on why that was not a good idea. And, it, you know, that's why I'm here to help you guys, because I have learned so many things through trial and error and making the mistakes. So hopefully I have made the mistakes so you don't have to. Um, so yeah, if you're photographing orange food, don't use orange napkins. Maybe that's obvious. That's obvious. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Do, do, do. Hey, JMK Crave TV. Hey, if you guys want uh, reviews of uh, various restaurants, you should go check out his channel. It's a lot of, I love all the YouTubers on here. I love YouTube. Did you take professional photography classes to learn about it? And do you recommend it for beginners? So that is a great question. Um, I have not, I'm self-taught now, self-taught in the sense of, I have sought out a lot of mentors. I have uh, various people who I have connected with here in the Phoenix area who do what I now do when I started out, who were doing what I wanted to do. And so offering assistance. Um, now some folks are overwhelmed and taking on an assistant, um, is not feasible. I mean, that's just the reality. But certainly if you can find somebody to mentor you, that to me is the most valuable because you learn by doing. And so being on a shoot, those kind of things can be super duper helpful. And of course, YouTube, there was not, you. I mean, there was YouTube when I started doing photography, but the amount of photography tutorials that exist on YouTube compared to even like two years ago is mind blowing. So you can learn so much from YouTube. Um, but for me, I learned the best by getting in there and just messing around with it. Like literally got these speed lights on Friday and spent the entire weekend shooting this way, shooting that way, experimenting trying. And so that has been my photography journey so much. I will say um, there is a great ebook if you are just getting started. Um, I mean, I certainly have my video series, the um, food photography essentials, you know, that sort of building blocks of what's aperture, ISO, uh, shutter speed, white balance, how those all work together. Um, but if you are more of a reader as opposed to a watcher and learner, uh, the folks over at... Um, Pinch of Yum, pinchofyum.com. They have a great food photography ebook. It's their tasty food photography ebook. And it's a great, again, great fundamentals baseline. That's where I actually got a lot of my good fundamentals and baseline. Um, but yeah, and then just the continued journey is networking, getting to know other photographers, uh, collaborating with people, seeing how other people do it. So as far as going to school, um, I would say there are so many free ways to learn photography that that's a great way. Now, I do think that there's a lot of value in a formal education too. So, you know, a lot of my knowledge comes from having an, a, a 
official accredited art degree. So understanding light and color and those kind of things, composition, so much of that came from that education. So it kind of depends on your situation. I do think though, if you don't have the financial resources to go to school for food photography or for photography, um, you can definitely do it on your own. It's, it's doable, but it's all about finding the right people to help support your journey. Um, let's see, would you consider making videos about the whole photo shoot process from idea to editing? Absolutely. That's a, that is definitely a great, a great question. And so for sure, I'll put that on the list. Um, oh, the, uh, when will I learn? Got a lot from the art of photography back in the day. Um, that wasn't even on YouTube to start with, um, but was a video podcast. Yeah, there are podcasts, there are channels and there are channels popping up every day. There was another one. I'm trying to remember his name. Um, getting, I'm getting tons out of it. And Travis transient. He's also here on YouTube. He's got some great photography, uh, tutorials. Some, he's like a ninja when it comes to, uh, the Photoshop and Lightroom world, I would say post-processing is not my strongest suit. Now I do, I am pretty dangerous in Lightroom and actually Thursday's video is a Lightroom tutorial. Um, but I would say my, my passion is more for the shooting aspects of it. So, you know, there's, there are, you know, Flern, he's great. Oh my gosh, I've learned so much from him. So there are so many resources out online. Um, all right. Since you just got speed lights, this guy, David Hobby, is the king of speed lights. King of, I want to be the king of speed lights. Well, I couldn't be because <laughs> I have to be the queen of speed lights. <laughs> they are a whole lot of fun. Um, Clever Cookie wants to know, did I always do food photography? And yes, that's that my first gig that I booked was food photography every gig since. Now I do some portrait photography only for friends because <laughs> I don't want it to become my business. I have got enough to keep me occupied 10 days a week uh, in food photography. And so, uh, you know, around the holidays, around October, November timeframe, all my friends who want family portraits, you know, I'll do a couple of those sessions and, and those are fun and those kind of change things up. And I would say, Learning portrait photography, which is a whole different ballgame, has been very helpful to my growth as a food photographer because it is a different discipline. It really is. Some people may not think so, but I, I think it's just a whole different ball of wax. Aside from, of course, the subjects don't sit still. Um, I did a photo shoot for some friends. They have four little kids, ages eight and under, <laughs> and then two parents. And we did this shoot. And oh my gosh, I mean, you want to talk about trying my patience. It's, you know, four kids under the age of eight. Nobody's going to keep a happy face all at the same time. So it was, uh, it was a good challenge, but then I come back to food after doing things like that. And I'm a stronger photographer. So put yourself in different situations for sure. Uh, do you do a better job if you get to eat the food before the shoot? Um, I, you know, remake by Jorge, to be quite honest, most of the times when I do restaurant shoots, I don't eat any of the food. I don't eat it before. I don't eat it after it's props to me. I, I just don't look at it as food. So, um, I mean, it is food, but it's more so um, props and a job. And so the food, the eating part of it, I don't know. I just, <laughs> I don't eat the food typically. Now, some restaurants, though, are very much like, especially a lot of the smaller mom and pop shops, they, you know, this is food cost and they don't want to waste the food. And so then sometimes they'll box it up and want to send me home with it. But for the most part, most of the folks that I'm working with, I'll shoot the food and then they take it and do whatever with it, maybe give it to the staff. I don't know, but I, I rarely ever eat on shoots. Um, please link that. I'll have to, uh, wishing Melon, let me know what I'm supposed to link. Um, all right. Is that liquor in the mug? No, I am nearly three years sober. So this is, this is water. It's water. Cause I drank way too much coffee today. So <laughs> not liquor. All right. Let's see what else. I think we got most everything. Did I get most everything? Um, glad you guys are all here. So anyway, I got really close to the screen. Sorry if I'm up in your face. <laughs> I'm just excited about these guys, though. Again, little soft, little uh, wispies in the back. So keep keep your eyes peeled for peonies and eucalyptus in the back of my shots upcoming. But all right, I think I think we've got most everything. Um, finding clients is another aspect you're interested in. Here's what I'm going to tell you is the best way to get clients. This is how I get. This is how I still get clients today. Um, 
I will find a client that I want to work with now how to determine who that will be. Um, when it, I really personally love shooting for food brands. So, you know, like I was doing a sun-dried tomato shoot for a sun-dried tomato company this morning. Um, the way that I get the majority of those clients is I go and I find the product or a similar product, um, usually their product though, and I will take photographs of it for free on my own volition as kind of proof of concept. And then I'll post them to social media and share those. And then I will send the link to their marketing PR person or just send a message through Facebook or Instagram or whatever. Say, hey, I love your product. Just want to let you know I took some photos of it. Here's the link. Yada, yada. Thanks so much. You know, um, and then inevitably, strangely enough, <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes if I'm really going in for the kill, I'll say, by the way, I'm a food photographer. Here's a link to my online portfolio if you ever need anything. Um, but I don't even sometimes need to do that. And they'll come back around and say, oh my gosh, you know, hey, uh, we're actually looking for a photographer. Now, does that happen every time? No. And does that usually happen right away? No. But maybe three, four, five months down the road, they'll come around and say, hey, we really like that picture you took so many months ago. Um, what can you give us a quote or can we talk through what it would look like for you to do more work for us? And that that is how I've literally gotten all of my clients. <laughs> and yes, it takes a lot of work to go and do work, but you should be shooting anyway, right? So what's what's the problem of, you know, having a little proof of concept? Because there are so many photographers out there. Um, so, you know, just doing a little little bit of love on the front end, give before you expect to receive. That is always, you know, you got to be generous first and then inevitably, um, you know, you, you have a lot more luck that way. So that, that is how I get clients. There is no mystery to it. I still do that. Um, and it still works. And I know other people do that as well. So it's a really good, really good tactic. Um, always brush your teeth. Yes. Make sure to brush your teeth. Bad breath won't get you clients. <laughs> um, what inspires you and keeps you going when you feel like quitting? Um, you know, I don't know what it is, San. I, uh, I mean, there's plenty of times when you want to quit, right? You're like, and I did quit actually food photography and videography. It was, uh, at a point last year, I just was so frustrated because I was trying to do too many things. I was trying to have this cooking YouTube channel. I was doing a lot of TV segments. I was doing, you know, just too many things. And so I just said, I need to stop everything, um, reevaluate and really help my husband focus on his real estate business. Um, but inevitably, it came back around. I was like, I miss, I miss photographing food. And so that's when I doubled down on food photography, uh, and really sort of let everything else go by the wayside and focused on this fully. And it has made all the difference. So, um, I think if the love is there, if the passion is there, that will continue to sustain you. I do think that you have to realize that you're going to get super frustrated and know that you're going to get super frustrated, but continue to push through that. And that realizing just being able to mentally check yourself and go, Oh my gosh, I am so frustrated at this and go, okay, that's good evidence that I'm doing something right. <laughs> I mean, there is sort of that difficult call of like trying to do something because it's not going to work as opposed to something that when you hit a roadblock and then you push through it, you know, just like for the folks who, you know, when you first learned how to shoot manually, you're like so frustrated. I'm never going to get this. I'm never going to push through. Um, but if you do and you, then you realize this is normal. This is normal to feel frustrated. This is a good thing to feel frustrated because once you get through that, it's going to be so rewarding. So, all right, let's see. Can you do a video on how to price your photo shoot? How do you know what to charge? So Jenny, I've actually got something very exciting in the works. Ah, little preview here. Um, that I am going to be putting together a little proposal builder for you. So stay tuned for that. I know you're excited. <laughs> um, and uh, can I do a live video while I do a photo shoot? Well, I've got a photo shoot that might be perfect. For, I can't do that for all clients. Um, you can definitely check my Instagram stories. I'm at the bite shot. Uh, like today, I was in a shoot this morning and you got a lot of BTS over there, a little behind the scenes, but I will definitely, um, I've got a shoot that's a more involved restaurant shoot, hiring a food stylist, the whole kit and caboodle. It's a three day shoot. So, uh, but I'm, you know, I really love those owners and they would probably be open to us doing doing some live streaming. So stay tuned. We'll see if that works out. Uh, photo quote, Jarrett. Nice. Very, very helpful. I love it. I love it. All right. Let's see. Did I miss anything else? 
All right. I think we got it. I think we got it. Oh, can you start your food blog with just your phone camera? Absolutely you can. The best camera, of, all photographers say this, right? The best camera is the one that you have. So shoot with shoot with what you got. It's totally, totally kosher. Um, because the thing is, and you know, people always want to know what's the best camera to buy? Which one should I start with? Well, it's not going to be your last camera. So just buy what you can afford and know that you're going to get more later. <laughs> ah, all right. Uh, da, 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 da. I think we got it. Uh, what's my favorite food to photograph? I will photograph any sort of berry all day long. Strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, berries. They're just oh, the highlights. Give me a break. I can't handle it. I love, I love berries. <laughs> but meantime, one thing I did forget to mention, um, I did create a website specifically for the bite shot. So you can go to the bite shot.com, the bite shot.com. Um, and what's great is that I have, I will be adding classes there. So if you want more than what you are getting out of YouTube uh, from me for free, that you can pay to be a part of classes, in-person human interaction classes. So I have um, one coming up in April. It is here in Arizona, uh, but it's going to be a blast. It's only eight people. So it is seriously hands-on. We will shoot artificial. We will shoot natural light. We're going to style food. We're going to edit food. We're going to do the whole thing. It's eight hours. I'm going to pack it. I'm actually going to have home work before the class so that everybody is fully prepared. Um, but that that's going to be a lot of fun. Or if you ever want one-to-one, -one, I'll do one-to-one -one coaching as well. You can get that over at thebiteshot.com. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, plenty of other courses to come soon. So what is the worst food to shoot? Oh, there are a lot of hard, hard foods to shoot. Well, when you're in a restaurant, if they ever do the styling for you, you're not doing the styling. Uh, there was one in specific, they served a short rib and it was just a short rib with a dark sauce on it, on a plate, no garnish. <laughs> I mean, how do you make that not look like poop? <laughs> it's really hard. Uh, so I did, I did my best. Um, and the one food that drives me nuts every time, I just struggle with it the most are quesadillas. Quesadillas, just the angles, I, they, ugh, they make me crazy. So I have like a go-to way that I will show, shoot, shoot, bleh, a go-to way that I will shoot quesadillas, uh, but they always still infuriate me. They just, <laughs> there's something about them the texture the color the orientation of it the triangles the whole thing makes me crazy um all right you uh let's see wishing melon purchased a canon rebel t350 millimeter starting your food photography that is great that's perfect that's a camera you should shoot with it get to know it love it um you know dig into the camera that you have don't don't worry about it because you know i've bought many cameras and i continue to buy more cameras because as you grow with this whole world of food photography you'll realize you need other things but to me the lenses are more important and i would say a lot of photographers would say that too the lenses are more important than the body i mean the body's it's all important but i'd rather invest in lenses uh, between a 100 millimeter macro 2.8 and an 85 millimeter normal f 1.4 1.8 for next investment, what to get? Oh, that's such a that's such a hard question because it totally depends on you. Now, recently, a lot of the shoe diving I've been doing, I've been like thinking, oh man, I really need to add an 85 millimeter to my collection. I do not have one. I do not have anything that accommodates that focal range because um, that focal length because I've got the 24 to 70, I've got 100, uh, and I've got a 50, and then I've got some other ones that only apply to my uh, crop sensor. But uh, I, the other day I was like, oh, I really need 85. But for me, I feel like 50 and 100, those cover the majority of food photography. So I would personally go for the 100 millimeter. You're also going to get that really nice compression on the back, um, you know, in terms of the background on your images with the uh, 100 millimeter macro. And you just, even if you're not doing a super close up image with a macro, um, it just, it's the definition, the sharpness, the, it's just really yummy. Um, Dennis the Prescott has a great video all about why he loves the 100 millimeter lens. If you do not follow him, you should definitely go check out his channel. He's got a great video on that. He also just put out a video all about the gear that is in his, uh, his bag. And, you know, anybody who knows Dennis the Prescott from Instagram, you know, like he is food photography goals defined. <laughs> so he's sharing a lot of those tips over there. So definitely go check out Dennis. Um, have I ever used non-food items to imitate food items like was used in advertising years ago? Uh, no, 
No, I use, I use all real food. Has there ever been a time? No, when, when it's ice cream, it's ice cream. Now I will use different things to make the food behave the way I want it to, right? Like the old glycerin trick, which I talk about in the food styling tips video. Um, there's another thing called, uh, I got this one from, oh, what's his name? Steve Hansen. Uh, he recommended in a video from B&H using poop freeze, which is very similar to that stuff you clean your keyboard with, uh, but it you can buy it on Amazon. And it's an aerosol. And what it does is it freezes things. It's really, really cold. So if you've got ice cream, I did a bunch of work for dryers for a good year or two. Um, <laughs> it was, of course, I'm here in Arizona and the space that I was working in was having air conditioning trouble. So this poop freeze was a lifesaver. And you just spray it wherever there's a drip and it whoop, freezes it right back into place. Um, so yeah, I, I am, when you see my food, it is food. Now there are little things like the little makeup sponges and other things hidden to make the food behave the way it's supposed to, but the food itself is always food. Um, have you ever used a Canon 135 millimeter pro series for food jets? I have not Joshua. Do you and anybody else does? I have not hundred millimeter is as far as I go at the current range. I just don't have I've never personally been in a situation where I was like, oh, I need a longer focal length. Because, I mean, I'm also <laughs> working in very small spaces. I don't know if my studio seems gigantic, but it's uh, it's maybe four, 450 square feet. So it's not huge. So I don't have a lot of distance that I'm working with. And I don't do extreme close-ups either. It's just my style. Um, will you write a book about food photography? Jay, I would love to. Let's just, let's find some hours. Let's do it, man. I would love to write a book. I bet, well, I am going to be working on an ebook very soon. I do have my free ebook, which is um, all about landing your first gig. So you can definitely go get that. If you just go to the biteshot.com, you'll find, if you just scroll down a little bit, it's got my free ebook. You can download that there, but definitely some ebooks in the works. Um, I look at pictures of food <laughs> differently since joining this group. That is what it is all about is really training your eye, right? Like that's when everything opens up to you is being able to look at somebody else's image instead of like just seeing it as a pretty picture of food to really like, oh, which direction is the light coming from? Oh, how deep are the shadows? You know, what are the colors they use? Like really sort of mentally taking them apart. That That is what you want to be doing. That's when magic happens. So, oh, I'm glad that Chef Morel, that your flat lays are going well. That is awesome. Flat lays are a whole lot of fun. So, all right, I'm going to go ahead and jump off because I've been on here almost an hour and uh, my kids are going to start getting hungry. I'm making butter chicken for dinner. Does that sound good? If you guys want butter chicken, come on, come on over. <laughs> going to have that. But meanwhile, Thursday, new video. It's going to be a Lightroom tutorial, some little things that you may or may not have known are in there that are just helpful um, for highlighting the food. Uh, yes, I figured a couple of you might like some butter chicken, some butter chicken. Um, and then, and then, yeah, there's lots more fun to come. So thank you again, you guys, for the 10,000 subscribers and for being so enthusiastic and having great questions and being so positive. And if you're not already, we've got the Facebook group, which you can join. I will uh, be sure here, facebook.com slash groups, the bite shot. Um, we've got going on, I think 1600 photographers, food focused photographers who are all positive. If you're negative and a pain in the butt, I just, I, boot you from the group. That's how it goes. <laughs> um, so it's all very positive, engaged, enthusiastic people who are interested in supporting one another. You can post your photos, look for constructive criticism. Um, and it's hopefully a helpful group as well. All right. So <laughs> Nathan, yeah, it's going to be a bit of a, a trek from New Zealand to get Phoenix, Arizona, but, but we'll wait. All right. We'll see you guys later. Okay. You take care. See you Thursday. Bye.